Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and I hope everybody's had a wonderful, wonderful day. If not, it's going to be wonderful after this. That's what we're hoping anyway. So tonight my guests are, and that is multiples, Frank J. Bennett, author, pain in the uh, rear, Um, good friend of mine, and Cheryl Ann Elliott Fletcher, another good friend of mine. She's a medium and very knowledgeable on a multitude of things, as well as, so is Frank and so is Chris Houston. All of them are very knowledgeable. I can't make everybody sound wonderful when I when they're all wonderful. So we're going to talk about anything that comes up today under the sun, under the moon. And we're going to figure it, figure out what we want to talk about. And hopefully you guys are there to give us some questions and make this more interesting. So welcome, Frank, Cheryl, and Chris. I, I really think because I'm not as good as Cheryl and Chris that I should have more positive press because I really need it. <laughs> well, well, I, that, that's not necessarily the truth, Frank. I've had some outstanding uh, religious and theological theological conversations with you that are amazing. In fact, I've dug your brain a couple of times. <laughs> What's left of it? <laughs> well. I've ha- I know that I've had Cheryl Ann on my show many times, Frank as well. Chris, I've never had you on the show before, so tell everybody a little about yourself. Oh, uh, that's a dangerous thing to say. <laughs> well, I'm just saying a little. I don't mean you have to really expound a whole lot. <laughs> well, my day job is in business and marketing and PR, obviously, so I've had a chance to work with a lot of people on and off throughout the years. Um, I did a stint on regular FMAM radio, and then I went into digital. And believe it or not, when I went into digital, your uh, producer of this show, Kat, actually gave me a lot of tips. So thanks, Kat, by the way. She was wonderful, filled me in on a lot of things I didn't know about. Um, But I spent a lot of my spare time due to a personal situation in the paranormal for – it's almost 20 years this year. I don't count my childhood years. I know a lot of people like to fib and go, oh, I've been in it for over 30 years, yada, yada, yada. No, it's it's going to be 20 years this year with me um, on a personal search because of what happened to me, picking most people's brains, working with universities, working with some major uh, organizations throughout the years, the United Paranormal Society of, um, of America, um, gosh, uh, um, the Roman Catholic Church at one point. Uh, Don't get me wrong when I say that, by the way, guys. I did not work in exorcism and all this other stuff. My job was just simply to help them in specific areas for interviews for other people to orient them to the right positions. Um, And, uh, oh gosh, all kinds of things. Um, Research, university research, cultures. I spent three and a half to four years of my life just traveling across the United States of America and 
a few lucky other areas to spend time with Native Americans, the Jewish society, um, the Gypsy society. You name it, I've done it. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have to get back into your re- you know your reasons for getting involved. Cheryl Ann, how long have you been involved in the in the paranormal? It's going on 47 years. I love it. Um, Being a psychic, um, renowned uh, psychic medium, due to a death experience at the age of 11, it is nothing but my life. It's all the time, Denise. I I know that, that, that you live your life in the paranormal every day. And I know that you've been, uh, that you're getting ready to, you, I don't know if you're get, getting ready to start a new venture or you've already started your new venture. Actually, my uh, my old adventure, which is current still, uh, with Extraordinary Connections with Cheryl Land, which, in fact, is where I got into gallery reads, individual reads. I'm contracted out as well when it comes to the paranormal investigative teams. And then my newest adventure is um, I'm launching... In a couple of weeks, my uh, extraordinary life coach um, business, but I'm also writing a book and you know, I've done quite a bit in my lifetime. Yeah. Wow. I can't wait to hear about the book, but congratulations on your new venture. I knew that, you know, I knew that it was coming up. I didn't know how soon. And, and I think that you'll be a great life coach. You're always so positive and, and you know, telling people how you truly feel and, uh, giving them honest feedback. Exactly. So, um, okay, Frank, your turn. What got you involved Uh, in the paranormal? Well, I guess nobody really needs to hear my biography again, as everybody knows. And as Denise well knows, I, I was, I was born a poor black child in Baltimore city and I essentially just worked my way up from there. And, uh, just kidding. And, uh, my experience with the paranormal, as uh, Denise could tell you, began uh, when I was living in Baltimore County. And, uh, you know, when you're young, you don't know what you're experiencing. You're just young and experiencing. Years later, you're reflecting on these bizarre things and coming across stories and images and movies of things other people have encountered. And you're making connections and thinking, you, you know, you're putting more thought into it now, things you haven't really put much mind to for over 30, 40 years. Now, all of a sudden, you're researching. And that's that's uh, what led to the publication of my first book, The Bible. I mean, I mean Encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man, it's your story, <laughs> uh, accounting my own experiences and uh, my own examination uh, of the characteristics uh, of the things that I had seen and experienced and uh, my evaluation of what the conclusion of these things may be. So... Uh, today, I subsist as an author and speaker on these on these matters. Well, that's good because I just gave your name to somebody to be a speaker at an event. So they may be contacting you. Um, it's in it's in Iowa. Thank you so much. I forgot to get you something. Mm, no, you got me something. You sent me your latest book that you oh, right, partnered up with um, with the late great Don Wells. So um, I've. We'll oh, read. I forgot I sent you that. Have you read that? No, I got time to read this weekend when I'm in the hospital. So good. Yeah, um, uh, people don't know that, but Denise is about to go through some some serious stuff. So everybody listening has to put a lot of personal. Um, what's the word I want to use here? Your own personal spirit and graciousness into positive hopes for Denise. Well, mm-hmm. thank you, thank you so much, and. Uh, like I said, I, I'll have some time. I've got to stay in the hospital. It's about 24 hours after I get a room, so which is kind of weird. I've never heard of it put that way, but I'm going back to the hospital that my kids were all born in. No longer has maternity ward. So I just think that's strange that a hospital doesn't have a maternity ward, but apparently well, that's the way know, things go. Well, as you know, I just my wife was just in uh, UPMC Pittsburgh's main hospital for the same surgery you're going to have. Um, and somehow she came out with a boob job. I'm kidding, but oh, that's okay. That's what Ron keeps telling me is I should be telling everybody <laughs> I'm having boob reduction. <laughs> yeah. While you're in there, might as well get a little work done, you know, well, you he know, keeps put telling you, put me you tell, a, yeah, he keeps telling me to tell everybody it's boob reduction. That way they're not upset when they look at me and see that there's nothing <laughs> extra there. <laughs> 
So I just get your laughed. tires rotated while you're there too, you know. Oh, so I just I went for my <laughs> COVID test I, today. So I I was riding in the elevator on. She was in in the hospital for six days. And each day when I rode the elevator, I, I questioned the medical personnel that rode with me. You know, where's your COVID people? How are you guys handling being heroes and stuff like that? And Pittsburgh's hospital has got it down. I don't know why they're not on the news. I mean, they've got a separate wing just for the COVID people, which means that they, unlike other hospitals that have made the news, they've got the facilities to take care of people in accidents and emergencies and things like that. So uh, getting room, rooms are a premium. Uh, Cleveland <laughs> Hospital up here, unlike Erie, rooms are at a premium because of all the COVID. Mm. Well, I'm just glad it took a year to get this surgery um, from the day I found out that I had um, had what had this hiatal hernia and the severe acid reflux causing my voice to change and and everything else, I found out uh, a year ago on the 18th, and that was when I stopped breathing during during the um, the stu- the endoscopy. So, and I can't say it was a near death experience because somebody was right there. They got me breathing right away. They just moved my chin and got me breathing. Um, but now they're all concerned thinking that I could stop breathing while I'm doing this. Well, it's like, yeah, you can, you can stop breathing. I can stop breathing right now. So they're worried about you going under anesthesia. They, well, they just need to not over medicate me. That's what they did. They over medicated me. So, uh, which we all know how easy that is based on Michael Jackson and Prince and (laughs) so, so other than that, I mean, I'm, I feel confident about the surgery. I feel confident about the surgeon. I fought really hard for for at least six months to get the surgery, but COVID came in and stopped my journey for a while. And then I couldn't go back on my journey until June. And then in July, we started fighting with the insurance company. And December 30th, I got noticed that, hey, you, you can have your surgery. We're going to cover it. So a long journey, but hopefully it'll be worth it. And I'll have 13 little titanium metallic balls around my esophagus here real soon. Okay, so if anybody listening want to get your tickets to Denise Pridemore's boob reduction surgery, call <laughs> Chad Hobson at blah, blah, blah. You know. uh, so. Acid reflux is a bear, trust me. I've dealt yeah, with it for it almost, almost, God, 23 years. And I had a uh, surgery myself in my throat because of it at one point and my – nasal cavity at one point because i had issues with that at the same time it's a not a fun thing (laughs) no it's it's not it's not fun but you know thank everybody i thank you all for the prayers and next monday tune in if i have a show you'll get to hear how good it went so (laughs) so that that's what i'm hoping for i'm hoping to feel okay enough to sit up and talk for a little while and uh because i feel this is cathartic to visit with everybody and to talk so we're going to have so you guys know we have some commercials during the show so we've got a little bit before we have one so we're going to start out with um ghosts are they real (laughs) absolutely (laughs) that's a complicated question i know i'll tell you Why it's a complicated question? Because you can't answer that until you know what a ghost truly is. Scientifically speaking, throughout most of the universities I spoke at and a lot of the places, and Frank and I have had this debate back and forth, we don't know how to define what a ghost is past cultural experience and cultural belief. So is there something out there? The answer is yes. What is a ghost? Realistically, I can't tell you. I can only tell you the evidence, the data, and the situations that I get that match unexplained situation. Um, So do I believe they're real personally? Yeah, I believe all of this is real based off of my experiences. But but scientifically speaking, I can't tell you yes or no on that because the answer is I don't know. (laughs) Okay, Frank? Well, uh, in my book, Encounter with the Aberdeen Wall, man, a true story, uh, I – Mention one encounter I had on a you know dark country back road on the way to a nightclub I was walking down uh, with a girl who uh, was in my high school, or at least that's who I thought she was, looked just like her. 
and uh, that was the uh, that's an incident where uh, I looked into her face and she had no eyes, and I had no memory of what else happened that night. And um, the girl was alive; it was the spitting image of her, and I hadn't had any contact with her. But there's also another story in the book where my wife encounters a full-bodied apparition of a of a of a war reenactor at a historical site she worked at in New York, and the moral of the story behind those two incidences is that. They both appeared to me and my wife as anybody you would have encountered anywhere, even down to the smell. And it poses the question to the audience listening. You know, it challenges your your concept of what a ghost is, is that, you know, many of you listening may have already encountered a full-bodied apparition, even had a conversation with one, and may not have even realized it. Well, you know, somebody asked me a question uh, a couple weeks ago about how, how I see spirits. And one of the things that I told them was, is that they look just like you and me, but they don't have any feet. I, I just, they don't see, I don't see feet. And so, yeah, I mean, to me, I can see where, and of course I could be hallucinating. I, I don't know, <laughs> but there is a possibility that, you know, when I see these spirits, they look just like you and me walking down the street. I just don't see feet. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if anybody else is like that. Um, and do I, yeah, I believe, a, I believe that there's something there. Well, this is what Chris and I keep getting into yeah, is the mechanics and the physics of hauntings. Yeah. And that's proportionally what you're, what, what happens theoretically, theoretically mm -hmm. what happens and I've got a couple of physicists that are, are um, working with me on and off about this. Theoretically, what happens is the mind, the brain, the body, everything functions on a quantum level together throughout <clears throat> the energies and the processes. So that means that each brain deciphers these things a little bit differently based off of how they come to you on a quantum level themselves. Uh, and uh, Frank and I have batted around a couple of different theories there. Basically, what I would say logically is going on with you and why it seems different on all of us um, is because your brain is functioning on, a, on, on a, an enhanced level, but it's different than the next person's on how it taps into all the quantum energies and everything else that's going around. Um, so you're seeing a portion of the echo of a ghost or what is, what was, whatever you want to decipher it. Everybody calls it something different, um, but uh, – it operates differently on each human being because of the way our brain operates. Since we're all individual and we're different, we all tap these different energies differently, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, it does. But you know what? We're going to stop here. We're at our first break. You're listening to WBHM-DB.com out of Birmingham, Alabama. We'll be back with this great panel of guests in just a few minutes. So run, run, get something to drink, and come back. You don't want to miss, miss a second of this. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me. Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition 
bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see the spirits will talk to you, and the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and my guests tonight are Frank J. Bennett, Cheryl Ann Elliott Fletcher, and Chris Houston. And we are talking about anything and everything paranormal and Maybe even not paranormal. So whatever comes up. So uh, if you guys have any questions in the chat, please put them in there and I'll make sure they get asked. And uh, you might get an answer. I don't know. Um, (laughs) Cheryl Ann, being a a medium and a psychic, what do you find is the most annoying thing about other psychics and mediums? Well, to be blunt would be ones that call out things that they're really, really not seeing and or feeling or experiencing just to kind of make it like um, they know what they're talking about. I've been here. I've done that. I've seen people do this. And it's just like, you know, if you're going to call it out, you got to have absolute 100% proof of what you're calling out and what you're saying to other people. Because your credibility is everything when you are a psychic medium and or just practicing it. That's the, been the most hardest thing for me because people come to me and say, should I interview, you know, this person who's wanting to be on a team? And I say, absolutely. You want to make sure that each and every person in your team is read by that person and their accuracy when it comes to reading a person should be at least 85 to 90 percent because nobody's perfect so in the field of paranormal when they're out on a case and they're investigating you know some people you know just act like they know what they're talking about and that's the credibility that people need to understand is that if you're going to have somebody on your team saying that they're a psychic, then if you're going to put that person on your team, you need to make sure that they are not going to hurt your credibility. And I've seen that happen so often in teams that are investigating. It's just, you know, you got to be careful because there's people out there that will tell you anything you want to hear. So that's true. And what's so aggravating is like I've been in a position several times throughout my life of doing what I do where I've been working with other people that are, you know, learning, which is cool to be a psychic because we all have it. We all have that intuitional ability, but when, you know, if they're not doing it on a consistent basis and working on being able to open up and allow, you know, the spirits to talk to you and allow them in, you know, you're going to have a lot of issues with people wondering, are you in fact, do you in fact have somebody on your team that is telling the truth? So I the questionability. To, uh, 
I think that applies to all of the paranormal. In fact, I think that's one of Absolutely. the biggest problems we have right now with the paranormal is the word credibility. Exactly. Um, in, in the good old days, that really wasn't much of a problem. You, um, you didn't necessarily work with teams every day because mm-hmm. everything was specialized. So they'd call you in for specific things. Other people would come in too. And then they're like a team, but you may not work with them twice for a long time. Mm-hmm. But it was all about credibility. These days, so many teams are coming out of the woodworks and thinking that they can do the paranormal that it is highly – I hate to say this, but it's highly doubtful to get a credible team over a non-credible team, and they're going to tear you apart. You really have to pay attention to what you're doing. You really have to write people on your team. You really have to have trust factors in that, and you have to utilize things logically in that process because if you don't, basically all you're doing is just going, to, going into a home and repeating a process because of what you saw on TV. <laughs> exactly. And people do that. And what's really unfortunate about that is, is that, you know, if you're filming it and or you're live or you're hoping to do a pilot show, you can't have somebody like, well, you know, that's not already been uh, validated long before you even start the process. So I always tell people um, my best advice to people is, is. You know, if, you, if you're wanting to have a psychic on board to help you prove without a shadow of a doubt that what you're getting is true and in fact is that you interview your person of interest that you want on your team to head your team in the psych, psych world, then, uh, you know, people need to just sit that person down and have them individually have that person individually read these people that are on the team. And then the team needs to come around and say, okay, you know, after that person is gone, you know, how much of that, what they told them is, you know, credible. And you should be able to tell immediately right then per each individual reading, whether or not they are creditable in the first place. I I agree. And, you know, vetting, every team member should be vetted regardless Mm -hmm. because you need to find out if there's any uh, agendas that are not apparently hidden. (laughs) Because sometimes there, there are agendas out there that. These team members don't care about TV. They just want to help people. And then there's the other team members that I just want to be on TV. I want to own a location. I want to be the center of attention. And Mm -hmm. as you heard, it's I, I, I. And I've seen that in teams, and it can break up a really close friendship. um, Well, and it's not necessarily just that. It's the fact that – and I know, again, this is controversial with most people, but it is true. You you have to – understand the education, the levels, and the experiences, and the skills of each individual person that you're utilizing. If I go into a home that seriously does have paranormal activity, then the first (laughs) thing I have to do is have people (laughs) rule that out. They have to investigate the ins and outs of it, and then they have to determine things. And that means I have to have specific educations in there and specific skill levels. To be frankly honest with you, I may not have. Mm -hmm. Um, That's complimenting. I mean, uh, yeah. what, what you do is you surround people, you, you know, if I'm going to go out on an investigation, I'm going to surround myself with people that are smarter than me in other areas. You know, like I want somebody who's really smart on the techie stuff because I may not be that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, each team member should accentuate the next one. We should all be, you know, I think that that's how we should be feeding off of each other in a good way. Well, and you should utilize everybody else around you as well, the education levels and so forth, because mm -hmm. even when you've got your core four or your core five people that are with you, sometimes there's going to be things that you can't, you simply can't answer. Um, And that's you mean we can't make it up as we go along. You you can't make it up as you go along, (laughs) unfortunately. (laughs) Though a lot of people are doing that these days. They are, (laughs) and I'm seeing it, and I'm going. I've never heard that before. Where in the heck did that come from? Where's the research that goes behind that? But that that's me and and stuff. Frank, do you have a feeling about uh, mediums and psychics on paranormal teams? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> what? 
Okay. Might as school. well might as well bring bring Shaggy and Scooby too. I mean, heck, they were successful. Well, you know, yeah, you many many you that. just as um just as the the fine lady said, there are many people who have psychic abilities and mediumship abilities. Many don't even realize they have it until they're pressed to, or in the situation to know so. So, you know, hey, you know, might as well bring the professor and Marianne while you're at it. Well, why not? And but if you're gonna do if you're gonna bring Scooby and Shaggy though, make sure you bring your Scooby snacks. Damn straight. Because I know Last thing Gary, you want is a hungry dog. Well, Gary always brings the snacks every time. He brings little Debbie cakes all the time, and Ron loves the zebra cakes, and so <laughs> so it works out. Um, Cheryl Ann found that out that we had we always yes. have a lot of food when we investigate. So um, we do have oh. a question to to talk about, and Gary asks, "What is the difference between an apparition and a demonic spirit?" Oh, for the love of God! Well, that's um, again, that's that's a complicated <clears throat> question. I think first, first off, Gary, you should understand that the word demon is entirely overused. In fact, in factual reality, the investigations of demonic activity is less than one percent in the past fifty years, and out yeah. of that, there's only about two point five percent of that that has even been deeply investigated as being connected to or possibly is demonic in activity. Um, Let me give you a little background on Gary. He's a minister. Ah, nice. That's why he's asking that question, because he knows, you know, Frank Frank's involvement with Bible by Bennett. So he, you know, because there's a lot of, a lot of these shows, if you listen to them closely, all apparitions are demonic. And so how would you determine the difference between those based on the popular TV notion that every place is demonically haunted, which we know that's not true, but how do, how would you know the difference between the two? Well, can I give an example? No, you can never – well, now, now there's a problem. You use the word no. No implies factual knowledge, and in the paranormal world, that simply is not a quantitative item. <laughs> That's it's not possible to do that. We don't have a technology that can make us know the difference. And they they do present themselves eventually in a repetitive motion where you can identify certain things. But Frank is right. If you ever encounter a real demonic entity, um, sometimes there's no idea that that's what it is until until it reveals itself, until it wants you to know. <laughs> Denise, right. can I give an example? Yes, yes okay. please. All right. This happened at about uh, seven years ago. My niece, Jamie, and she doesn't mind that I ever talk about this because it does educate people that have that question. She actually, her friend called me over to her house and said, Aunt Cheryl, something is wrong with your niece. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yeah, she hasn't taken a shower. She stinks. Um, I said, well, you know, that's not unusual for people. Sometimes they don't shower. Well, you know, and uh, I said, okay, what else is going on? And she said, well, Jamie is talking in tongue. And I said, really? I said, okay. And she said, I think you need to come over and, uh, you know, see what's going on. Okay, so I did. I packed up my gear, which I don't use, not unless someone else needs it, because I don't. So I packed it all up, went over to her house, and in Christ, I tell you, I tell you right now, um, when I got on my vehicle, anything that I work with and or work around that is of what I call demonic, I get, I vomit. I get mm. sick. I know, I know that this is an, uh, this is going to get ugly. <clears throat> so when I walked up to the house, um, as I was walking up to the house, I saw Jamie, my niece, over by the picture window of her home. And as I approached the door, um, EJ, which was her friend, opened the door, and I looked to my right, and Jamie was not one time seen in that pick that window to come up behind ej as quickly as she did so when i opened the door i looked up and there's jamie and she said what the f are you doing here my niece would never say that to me 
ever. Mm-hmm. So when I approached and went into the house, I thought, okay, we've got some behavioral issues. Okay. You know, you try to try to debug. And so as I'm walking in the house, I, Jamie gets up in my face and she starts calling me all sorts of names, which I stood there and just smiled. So EJ explains to me at that point in time, as we were talking about the situation, she said, Aunt Cheryl, everything is happening in the basement. I said, oh, really? So we go down to the basement while Mm -hmm. we're down there. My niece, Jamie is sitting there and her her eyes were not normal at all uh she looked at me like she could kill me Uh, yeah you know and i'm like this is not my niece this is something else well as i'm talking to jamie she's sitting there rocking you know like front back front back and i'm like jamie are you okay she looks at me and she says no i want to kill you And I said, oh, you do. I said, I don't believe it's you that's talking to me. Who the heck is talking to me? And then all of a sudden, her back arched back on the couch. And I kept saying, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie. I literally laid her down. And I watching me do this. I laid her down on the back onto the couch. I sat on her at 143 pounds. While I'm sitting on her, I, she is con- like convulsing, and I'm thinking to myself, "Okay, we got a, con- a seizure going on." So I'm I'm sitting on her, and um, sh- sh- her body levitates off the couch, two inches. EJ saw it. Steve saw it. We have witnesses to it. And as I'm screaming into her face, asking her who her Lord and Savior was. She couldn't even say Jesus. She couldn't say Christ. She couldn't say anything. Her mm-hmm. tongue could not actually get it out. And as I'm looking down into her face, I'm two inches from her face, and her tongue came out to be exactly almost two inches longer than normal. She tried to bite my face. Her eyes, honest to God, were not the same color. They were dark. Is that I'm sitting on her and I'm screaming at her, who in the age has my niece? And the name of Leo came out of her of her mouth. And we were praying over her. This went on for eight hours. Eight hours of constant prayer in Christ, constantly praying over Jamie. And as it all kind of finally ended, Jamie went from a weird color. Her skin was a a weird color. And something came out of her. It hit the wall. It went in, literally went into her, um, her laundry room, shattered the window and out the window it went. And this, and I'm telling you, this is uh, God's honest truth. So when it comes to anything else out of you. Yeah. Okay. And so like when that happened to me, that that was totally demonic. Now, when it comes to the grays or the ghosts and things of that nature, to me that, OK, here's my theory. When we pass away at the time we die, whatever we're doing at that time, we obviously carry over. So let's pretend like I was in process of, you know, robbing a, a store or whatever, and I'm shot and I'm wounded well, not wounded, but killed on the scene. Well, you know, uh, for one, you're going to wonder in the afterlife, for one, where are you at? Secondly, what happened to you? And that behavior that you were encountering at the time you died, you're carrying it over. So in my opinion, when it comes to ghosts, their behavior is who they are when you see the apparitions and what you see in the paranormal is what they were doing at the time of death. Well, that's actually okay. more accurate than you think. I'll I'll get into that if we ever have a okay. chance to somewhere yeah, along the line. Um, I want to tell you a little story, though, um, before I do that, that's similar to that, to give you guys an idea of how real the demonic world is. The question Re- is, is can you do this in two minutes or less? Um, yes and no. <laughs> okay. Get, get, yeah, get but, to but, a good... But Chris, but, Chris, before you do that, uh, there was an inaccuracy in what the lady just described. 
uh, you know, I, I, I hone in on details, and I think she was wrong when she reported her weight. I, th- I don't think it was 143. I think it was actually 145. Oh, <laughs> bless your heart. <laughs> you are such a sweetie. So, so, now, so now you're down to a minute and a half. So if you can get something good out for, for the next well, minute or I'll so. Put a, put a little bit of a thought into this because you Perfect. said what they are after they pass away is what they are. Theoretically speaking, just so that everybody knows on a quantum physics level, all energies transform, disperse, and recreate themselves. That's how we utilize them. The brain is no different than that. That means that everything you were before the time of death, if a ghost exists, still exists. Now, it's not your, it's not you, who you are now. What we call a soul is a little bit different. But everything that you were still exists. So theoretically speaking, if you did just get shot, that moment in time, how you felt, what you were doing, how angry you were, and so forth is still there until it dissipates, changes, or becomes something else, just like any energy. So when you think about a ghost, the big question is um, how alive is a ghost? It's everything that we were before we passed away without the human host. Yeah. Um, so that it's very accurate that you would say that because scientifically speaking, that's right. <laughs> okay, so at that, at Cheryl Anna's right, we're going to take a break. You're listening to WBHM-GB.com out of Birmingham, Alabama. We'll be back with Frank, Chris, and Cheryl Ann in just a few minutes. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and my guests tonight are Frank J. Bennett, Chris Houston, and Cheryl Ann Elliott Fletcher. And we have been talking about uh, all kinds of things. So, Chris, go ahead and pick up where you left off. Yeah, let's talk about the demonic a little bit because it's a little bit different than most people think. Although exorcisms happen and possessions happen, it's a little bit more rare than most people think on that particular level. But that doesn't mean that demons don't exist. Um, Later on, if we get a chance, I'll get into my history on how I found this out because I didn't believe in the paranormal at all when I was a teenager and I grew up and ran into something and now I believe in it 100 percent, which started my journey. But um, I have encountered the rare occurrences and some of these things, once you build your faith to a certain level and you know that these things can't harm you, they understand this too. Now, that doesn't mean they can't harm everything around you that doesn't mean they can't affect things and that doesn't mean that you don't develop these strange relationships with them because you know you're the good guy and you know they're the bad guy and they want to manipulate things to their advantage um so the demonic entities 
it's kind of weird because most of them operate a little bit differently than the way people think. Though they can possess things, a lot of times they spend more time in manipulation and oppression than they do actual possession. Um, and there's multiple steps within that process of them doing so. And in that process, you can also learn that not only do names actually have context, believe it or not, but most of those names that people read on the internet uh, think that they know are the actual names and so forth are not accurate at all. They have other names, real names that are shared regularly, um, and they show themselves. As an example, um, I've confronted several of these throughout the years. Uh, and don't get me wrong, guys. Don't do that. It's not the right thing to do. This is my method. I don't share it with anybody else. I don't engage it in any way, shape, or form. And there have been several people that have utilized that. But uh, when these things want to make themselves known, they do make themselves known. And they will pick at you, and they will move things, and they will make things fly around rooms, and they will take control of devices and talk to you. And they will rarely possess people and talk to you through those people. Very rarely, but they will, um, and I've actually encountered that multiple times. In fact, I always tell people, if you want to know if something evil is really there, take me into the room, and if it's there, it'll show, and that's actually true. That's my unfortunate gift, um, but uh, most people that have taken me up to that challenge and actually ran across that, they never want to investigate with me again. <laughs> oh, well, and uh, Gary… Uh, Pastor Gary says what you're saying is very true. Thank you, Pastor yeah. Gary. I appreciate that. Question, though. Does it have to be a demon to be that destructive? No. No. Mm -hmm. there, there's actually other things that are just as destructive. Um, well, because and, if you will peruse through Scripture, you will not find the word demon. Uh, uh, it is a later incarnation and a later translation from the Greek, daemon. From the Greek, yeah, daemon. Daemon. And it does not appear in the original scriptures, and that's, you know, it's, it, it was never intended to be used that way. It was just the Greek's way of describing something that seems to have more power to it or, or more authority to it. That's authority, what, that's what the it's word, an authoritative fear. Yeah, that's what daemon uh, actually translates is one of authority. One of authority and to be feared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in in that essence, yeah. And so, you know, and pe people today, in you know, we live in a culture that needs more. We need the high. We need, we need, you know, we need. We don't. We're not happy with just bland little spirits. We're not happy with just weak little, you know, harassing poltergeists. It's got to have some power, or weight to it. It's got to be a good story to tell. Well, and so for that reason, it has to be a demon. And unfortunately, that's also what's opened too many doors to – good and evil is a weird thing. Good and evil has been fighting this battle for centuries, whatever you want to call it, positive and negative, good and evil, God and the devil, however you want to call it. Everybody calls it something different. Um, I have my own faith, and, and a lot of people have different faiths, but this battle has been going on for years. Unfortunately, now that TV and media has played this off, that fascination with the word demon and evil um, – has opened up a lot of doors that people bring in that negativity on their own, and that's a whole other story. Believe it or oh, not. Oh, yeah, Denise, we've had a lot of discussions about how paranormal investigators are investigating uh, entities they themselves probably brought into the house. Oh, or yeah. created. Or created mm -hmm. themselves. Or manifested it somehow. Yeah. We've had this discussion. I've had this discussion many times that um, every time we go to a paranormal investigation, we, I tell people, I said, there are spirits here, but don't be surprised if your own spirits don't come out while you're here because of the fact that you've went to a haunted location wanting to speak to spirits, and yours might be the ones that are truly speaking to you, not the spirits here. I right. call those yeah, I mean, We've used the analogy of Zach Bagan so many times, it's getting old, but he goes in these different locations, and and on the ghost box, they, he hears his name, and you know, at the end of the sentence, it's probably, hey, Zach, your clown car full of ghosts is still sitting in the driveway when you left it running. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> or, or the demon in your pocket has been let loose. From... Yeah, seriously. Well, it's yeah. funny because I don't think people understand that, uh, and I guess it's just because I've been in motivational speaking for so many years, that you can actually manifest positive and negative energy. with, And the more people that are in the room looking for something that's negative, 
the more chances you have of manifesting something negative on your own that may not even be a ghost. It's it's all self-created, but that energy is designed in itself with what you were looking for, if that makes any sense. <laughs> well, uh, so much so. One of my favorite books uh, is The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, mm-hmm. and it, it defines wholly, and in a very Christian manner, by the way, how – a positive directing of both your mind and your heart uh, makes a better world for you and a better environment for the people in your life. Well, and that's yeah. exactly what it is. The more positive thinking you think, the more positive things return, the more positive motions you give out to people. And I know it's tough in society today because all we see is negativity, but um, but that's why yeah, we well, see you negativity. See, yeah, but you see, good is dull. Negative is exciting and edgy. We make mm-hmm. movies about negative. You, you know, tell me the last, the last big hit movie that had to deal with nothing but goodness. It had to been a cartoon, and that still has negativity in it. Everyone yeah. has some Disney kind cartoons of cartoons are chock full of them. That's right. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, my daughter said something to me today that she had gotten Finding Nemo for the baby. I said, "Well, I hope he doesn't pay attention to the very beginning because he'll cry because he's very sensitive." And she goes, what do you mean? And I said, we're, you know, the mother and all of his brothers and sisters are killed except for the dad and in this one fish. I said, you need to pay attention to that. There's it's it's there. And I mean, my kids used to cry at um, the land before time when the mother got killed. They paid that much attention to that, that they didn't want to watch that movie because it hurt too much. So this kind of goes back to. Every, but everything has negative in it to show you what good is. Because mm-hmm. I don't well, think otherwise and, and, you would know that. And I actually and, and, the reversal of that in most of my classes, and that is you can take – and this is terrible. Everybody goes, no, you can't. But you know you can take a positive notion out of everything negative. Um, and no matter what you, – you could throw it at me today, and I'll come up with something positive out of it. Um, whether it be a death or whatever, you can take a positive notion from all of that. It's just humanity – has a tendency, like Frank said, of of going to the more exciting things. Negativity is something that we all have in us. We all have doubts. We all have negativity. We all search for those things to kind of get the fear factor going, the f- uh, flight and fight um, reactions going and so forth. So we don't take the time sometimes to just stop and smell the flowers, no matter how negative it might seem. <laughs> yeah, hey, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great to have one paranormal team come back and complain that – well, we got a lot of activities, but it was just some nice old guy that showed up and changed the oil in my car and made all of us uh, made all of us uh, cookies. <laughs> That'd be so cool! <laughs> yeah, that, that damn so ghost cool. came in and cleaned my house. Damn, I was going to do I've that on Thursday. I've been waiting for that ghost. I need that ghost. I want one that likes to run the vacuum cleaner. Yeah, yeah. And how come ghosts never show up naked? Honestly, make it interesting. Actually, there is some stories of that. Um, that I no, that was just seen. Chris drunk. Well, no, actually, that, you know, there's a there story in, in Delaware, Pikeville. Ohio, of one of those. He's called the uh, he's called the naked naked pervert. There is a there was a boy off of campus, not a boy. He was a young adult, about 42 years old, that would. And this is a terrible thing to say, but he would get naked and spraddle himself in front of his big window every day. Well, somebody apparently didn't like that, and they shot him in the window. And this happened like 20 years ago. Now the campus swears to God that. Every year around the same month he was shot, they see that naked guy spraddled in that window. <laughs> Why not? There is a story of a naked ghost in eastern Kentucky out by Fish Trap Lake near Pikeville, Kentucky. And it's a, it's a woman, and she jumps on cars out there. And I told the lady at the Chamber of Commerce when she was telling me the story, I said, I only did that once, and nobody can prove it was me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you should have saw the look on her face her mouth her, i mean she was like 80 years old her mouth hit the desk but i'd ask her some other questions okay this this is, was weird i'd asked about haunted locations and she said well you need to go to the grave of octavia hatcher she was a member of the hatfield and mccoy's clan um one of one of the two i don't remember which one i think it was hatfield and she died and she they they think that she died from uh, they thought she died from depression after losing her baby, um, but she actually 
died from sleeping sickness. They had already buried her. And by the time they found out about sleeping sickness, it was too late. By the time they got to her grave and dug her back up, she had tried to claw herself out of the box. And all they found were the scratches and that she had died from sleeping sickness in her coffin instead. This was before they put the bell, you know, oh, yeah. waking the dead. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she was telling me this. And this lady goes, I know for a fact that this that this happened. And I was like doing the math in my head and it was over 140 years ago at the time and I'm like oh okay <laughs> and of course I just walked away at that point because you know she was full of it but you know it is funny so there are naked ghosts but what kinds of go- well we're not going to get into that yet but there are some ghosts that people have not said they've seen that if we're seeing all these other spirits why aren't we seeing spirits prior to you know, that we know are prior to the 1400s. Quantum physics. So so that's the simple (laughs) answer. It is actually because quantum physics travels, even though everything travels at the same time in the same motion, they travel in streams, waves, whatever you want to say, which means that interactivity is based off of how close the stream is. The further the stream is away, the more or less likely you're going to see that particular absorption of energy, which means... You're not going to see a dinosaur because the dinosaur theoretically right now, in truth, does not exist anymore. The quantum level and that line is so far out that it's never going to strand back. You're never going to see the reality of it, and the energy has already been absorbed and changed anyway. Uh, okay, well, now my argument to that would be if you're going to quantify that as energy, you know, positive protons, neutrons, electrons in motion – uh, at a specific rate, then I should be able to come along with a highly charged electromagnetic instrument, like, for example, a degausser, which is what I used to use way back in the day to take uh, the the weird distortions and colors out of the corner of TV tubes that, that would show up in old sets. It's called a degausser. And I, you can disrupt the electromagnetic, electromagnetic patterns inside your TV tube with this thing, and it'll rewrite itself. So I should be able to show up with one of those and interrupt the the um the ghost image with the not sun. necessarily if that, if that because true. what you're talking about is electromagnetic fields however the field positives and negatives are different depending on the variables involved when you're talking about physics so and you can degauss by the way central ohio is actually a degaussing point so if you have an old tv and the gaussing coil has gone plug it in and if you want to see those colors go back to normal just turn it seven times to the left seven times to the right seven times to the left and it'll degauss on its own <laughs> this is what's cool about chris i could say i could bring i could bring up a degauss or an instrument that hasn't been used by people in 25 years he knows what it is <laughs> well, well you know it's good to have somebody on the team that knows something everybody else doesn't know so there we are yeah, now, that, now, now, we've gone full circle on that one but you know what well, yeah, i can't let you start you see, Physical yeah. physical objects in a 3D universe, in a physical universe, must obey physical laws. And the spirit apparitions we, of all kinds we have observed simply do not obey physical laws and have not shown to have been affected by anything we manipulate in our universe. Well, we have no way of affecting uh... them. Neither does Q waves and several other things. That's where the other alternate energies come into effect. As an example, mm-hmm. um, Einstein – went back to Tesla's theory. Tesla believed that, um, and they call it several, we'll call it energy X as an example, that energy X is the energy that you can't see, okay? If you could harness that energy, if you could just take your hand in the air and prick that small molecule and figure out how to utilize that, you could power a whole city. And Uh, at that whole city, we're going to have to take a break because we're at the top of the hour. So uh, you're you're listening to WBHM-DB.com. Please enjoy the news. Hopefully there's something good there. If not, make up your own news and be back here in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Support for NPR comes from Sattva, the comfort company. Sattva luxury mattresses are sold online and priced at about 50% less than mattress stores. Visit sattva.com slash NPR today and save an additional $225. Live from NPR News, I'm Janine Herbst. After many Texans got huge electric bills after last week's winter storm, Texas Governor Greg Abbott today says the Texas Utilities Commission, for now, will stop sending out bills and there will be a moratorium on disconnects.
for non-payment. Meanwhile, as Texas thaws out, the state's water utilities are slowly coming back online. But as Texas Public Radio's Jerry Clayton reports, millions are still without regular water service. Portions of major Texas cities, including Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, have restored some water service, yet millions of people across the state are still under boil water notifications. Many of those are expected to be rescinded early this week. In San Antonio, as of Sunday afternoon, more than 90 percent of water service had been restored, but about half the city was still under a boil water notice. Municipalities in many cases are waiting for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to test water supplies. City and county governments, along with many nonprofit organizations, continue to hand out water to residents across the state. I'm Jerry Clayton in San Antonio. President Biden's nearly $2 trillion coronavirus relief package goes before Congress this week. As NPR's Barbara Sprunt reports, Democrats hope to include a, min- include a minimum wage increase to $15 an hour. Democratic Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal told CNN she believes the fight to increase the minimum wage is a fight worth having. If we're going to be real about tackling racial inequity, economic inequity, then we are going to have to raise the minimum wage. President Biden has said he supports the measure, but is doubtful it can be passed through the Senate reconciliation process that only needs 51 votes. Progressives argue the measure would affect the federal budget and therefore falls within the rules of reconciliation. The Senate parliamentarian hasn't yet decided whether that's the case. But two moderate Senate Democrats, Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, have already indicated they won't support using reconciliation to increase the wage to that level. Barbara Sprent, NPR News. The British government says every adult in the U.K. will be offered a first dose of the vaccine by the end of July. And Pierce Jackie Northam reports. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the accelerated target for vaccination will allow vulnerable people to be protected sooner. About one-third of British adults, almost 17 million people, have already been vaccinated. Under the new target, everyone over 50 or with an underlying health condition can be vaccinated by mid-April. The government has faced harsh criticism for its handling of the pandemic, which has left more than 120,000 people dead, the highest toll in Europe. A new variant earlier this year forced the UK's third lockdown, and Johnson is under pressure to reopen schools and businesses to help the economy, which has been battered by the pandemic. Jackie Northam, NPR News, Washington. This is NPR News. Thousands of protesters marched in Myanmar again today, denouncing the February 1st military coup and calling for elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi to be released. Yesterday, security forces fired on protesters in Mandalay, killing two people. Peaceful demonstrations were held in that city today. The military has been unable to stop the demonstrations and the civil disobedience campaign of strikes against the coup, even with a promise of new elections and warnings against dissent. The U.S. says it's deeply concerned by the violence. The damage from the winter storm and extreme cold isn't only in Texas. After nearly a week of freezing temperatures, farmers in Mississippi and Louisiana say they have lost livestock and crops. Stephen Basaha from member station WBHM has more. Farmers in both states have lost thousands of chickens as ice caused their shelters to collapse. Mississippi cattle farmer Carolyn Jones says she's lost at least seven of her cattle. All of this was stress an animal, and once that animal is stressed, then we're losing dollars because they're losing pounds. With pipes and ponds freezing, farmers are also worrying about cattle dying from dehydration. Louisiana farmers are concerned the frozen earth may have killed their sugarcane crop, but won't find out for several weeks. If the roots do not sprout, the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation says the state's farmers could end up losing millions of dollars. For NPR News, I'm Stephen Basaha in Birmingham. The average price of a gallon of regular gas is on the rise, jumping 14 cents over the past two weeks to $2.64 a gallon, according to the Lundberg survey. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore. And as Kat always says, if we could just keep going and let you guys hear the breaks, you'd be <laughs> amazed at what you'll hear. And um, Chris, do you want to finish? Or no, Frank, do you want to? Which one of you were going when we left? I think it was Frank. I think it was both of us. We were both kind of talking about um, 
uh, dowsing rods and, and oh, that was during the break. And, so, yeah. so here's the question that goes along with the dowsing rods. At least I believe so because I know it's Gary. He asked, "Why can I find grave sites that uh, ground penetrating radar units cannot find?" And for those listening, ground penetrating radar is also on TV called GPR. Well, so my belief. This is my belief, because there's no fact, okay, is that he is partially sensitive. He no, has a certain and, – and people who are psychic and, um, you know, I, somebody better, more knowledgeable than me is going to chime in on this, I know. But a psychic, a psychic uh, ability comes in flavors and it comes in degrees. And there are, there are those who have this certain attenuation to um, – be sensitive to certain kinds of spirit or certain kinds of spirit messaging. And I believe that his is attenuated to the dead, a certain kind of dead. Because well, like, scripturally speaking, not all dead are the same. It, it could be that. I mean, like I was explaining during the break, um, culture is a unique situation. And uh, culture, it, it, it's it's crazy and not at the same time, because when you actually witness specific rituals in certain cultures be it voodoo be it uh, jewish be it whatever it is witchcraft whatever it is you can see phenomenal things happen that you can't explain scientifically now i could tell you the herbs that they used i could tell you the rituals that they used and so forth but nonetheless this did happen period um, and that's because of all those abilities when you hone a specific ability be it psychic mediumship whatever it is when you start honing those abilities you start tapping into those abilities so as Frank said, you're finding the grave sites because that's your skill to do so. <laughs> exactly. And you know, what I'm most drawn to as a psychic is water, the element of water. And every time someone is missing when I'm called upon, I honed, I don't know why, but I ended up honing in on water. And a lot of times when I'm hold into an investigation and or uh, working along the side of law enforcement. It has to do with somebody either drowning or unfortunately dismemberment, or it could be any array of things. But the minute I hear about someone missing all of it, and, and I'm telling you, it's like it never fails. It has to do with water. And I can walk up onto a scene, and this is proven, I can walk up onto a scene, and I can look in a body of water, and I can see where that person is in that water. And I'll give you an example. And approximately um, seven, eight years ago, I was called by the television. There was a man missing up in uh, Elba, Nebraska. He'd been missing for days. And they thought he had, in fact, been out hunting. And they thought he had been shot during a hunting situation. So I drove from Lincoln, Nebraska, all the way up there with my husband and a, a bunch of kids. And I went up on that scene and I went up on a hill and I looked down into the water. And here's all these sheriffs and, you know, drag team and dog team and blah, blah, blah. And I break obviously the yellow tape you're not supposed to go through and i'm like i don't care i gotta find this guy he's in the water he's in the water so i go up onto this hill and i look down and his entire face is across the body of water so i for one that was my validation that he was in fact there so i am escorted <laughs> escorted by the sheriff department because they look at me and they point at me and they're like you i'm like oh crap i'm in trouble so they, <laughs> they come up and get me, and then Mark at the time approached the cops and said, look, this guy's been missing for seven days. She's only here, you know, to help find them for, clo you know, find this gentleman who's missing for closure for the family. So they take me down there. I walk down this island, and they are looking for this man in the water with sonar and everything. And I'm like looking into the water and I can see this man. His name was Bobby. I could see him entangled underneath all the tree limbs in the water. And I said to the police at that time, which I do work with 
a lot of law enforcement. And I said to them, you don't have it out far enough to see him. He's under the trees, under the water. He's hooked under there. He's not coming up. And they all thought he had been shot, you know, like out in hunting. I said, no, he's in the water. He's in the water. So what do they do? I also tell them, when you eradicate those trees, they look at me and they're like, how did you know there were trees? I said, there's trees in that water. And so my element of water. So the next day when I told him he would rise up on the bank, south end of the bank the next day on Easter morning of all things. In fact, he did. And I told them everything that had actually happened at that situation. Him and his new wife and child, they had argued. He'd been on this lake, which was in fact not, he was trespassing. And he was in there with the canoe and he was drunk. And he had his dog in the boat with him. And well, the dog capsized the boat. And I said, by the way, when you find him, he's going to have a really super big gash in his forehead. Well, guess what? They find him gashed in the forehead. He's in the water. And, and I can see into water. That's my story. Huh. That Again, you always have amazing stories. And Chris, you were going to tell us the story about how you got drawn into the paranormal. What caused your journey? It's a long story. I know several people have probably, if you've actually watched the Travel Channel or um, Discovery Channel, you've probably seen a couple of pieces on it now, but they massacred the crap out of it. I moved into a small Ohio area of Morrow County when I was six years old. We moved into a highly haunted house or what we assumed was haunted. In fact, the first day that we came in, um, we unloaded. We were happy. Dad had just bought this $80,000 home, beautiful home compared to our little compact hole that it was in. Uh, Mom had put up all the dishes in the cabinets, and we decided to go to sleep, and we heard this loud whap as hard as we could. So we all ran downstairs, and um, all the doors were open all of a sudden, and all the dishes had been pulled out of the cabinet and stacked up individually in the center of the table. Um, of course, dad wrote it off at the time and said, well, maybe it's just a kid, some kids around here playing a prank. But we were at this time, there's only three houses on the whole road. The road goes about five and a half miles in each direction. So um, asking around later, we found out that wasn't the case. But this proceeded to continue um, throughout 22 years of living there. Um, my sister had – she had stayed in a room, and then she kept saying she saw a dark figure in the closet – that was coming out after her, so she freaked out. I mean, totally freaked out. So we moved her out of that room. We moved mom and dad into that room. Mom and dad started to have fighting after that certain point. Dad went downstairs to sleep. Mom stayed upstairs. She started seeing things outside in the cornfields. Um, she started – ended up being manic depressant, bipolar. A lot of other things started to occur. She kept saying there's something in this house. There's something in this house. Um, and then eventually I started witnessing things at the age of about – Nine years old, I started seeing a little boy in the cornfield. Um, at first, he was distant, little red parka, no reason behind it, quite pale, kept getting closer and closer. By the age of 16 years old, uh, my family had already started going through divorce proceedings at that point. Um, and I was tinkering with electronics all the time because my dad had an electronics background. Um, and I was working in a piece of electronics at the time, and uh, – the speakers disconnected started giving off thousands of whispers over and over and over again, proceeded through the televisions. The TVs would turn on and off. Our electrical systems would go on and off, um, and it started slowly but surely tormenting me, I guess you could say.
there was only one house on the on the road a long time ago, and they did find him in a parka, but that little boy was not the little boy that attacked me. This thing was a lot deeper, a lot darker, made himself present throughout the years. Uh, in fact, we had a twisted relationship, I guess you could say, because at one point the fa- my faith took over. I had a very famous person come to my home. I never mentioned her name because I never got permission to, but she came with her husband. Her husband was sick at the time on the reference from a priest, actually, believe it or not, in Ohio. And um, she had told me some very good advice. She walked up to the home. The door slammed. The windows started going up and down, and she said, honey, this is not my battle. This thing wants you, and the only way you can defeat this is to understand your faith is key. We can guide you. We can walk you through it, but you have to understand these things only hurt you if you let them do it, um, and that started my that started my journey, long story short. Um, from there, I just wanted to know. I wanted to know. I wanted to know what I encountered. I left that home. Um, I will go back eventually. I've, I've offered to buy it several hundred times, but the people won't sell it even though they don't live there anymore. Um, and then I just uh, – from there, I started picking university heads. I started spending time with professors and colleges, spending time with cultures. I wanted to absorb all this to try to explain what I saw, um, and it's been a, a heck of a road since then. <laughs> I bet. Um, I think I saw that episode, but I'm not sure because, you know, so many of a haunting episodes are so similar. Yeah. It's a boy that's that's evil. It's a man that's evil. It's a little girl that's evil. And it's a boy that's being haunted. It's a girl who's being haunted. Or it's a mother and father being haunted. It's they all seem very similar unless it's unless it's a public place that people actually go to investigate. A lot of times we don't remember them. Well, they force they force that image too because that image sells. I know, um, and, and it's terrible because I was in there filming, and three of these shows for almost eight hours talking to these guys, and they wanted me to repeat things. Can you say it this way? Can you say it that way? Can you say it this way? And you had to stop at one point and go, "No, I can't. That's not true." <laughs> uh, when I, and, and, and if I may interrupt, notice that you know another point that was made earlier. Where are the spirits from 300 years ago and 400, 500 years ago? Where yeah. are they? Yeah, I, I want to know why I'm not seeing a T-Rex with its short little arms, you know, well, marching honestly, outside my house. That's because a yeah, lot of running around looking we, for Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, a, a lot of what we see is um, it is residual. We just don't know it. Residual can be more intelligent than you think, by the way. I know that television has broken down to this is this and this is this, but reality is residual can communicate with you just as much, especially if those quantum bubbles are a little bit closer than you think um, because they're still talking to you in their time. You just don't know it. Um, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of it's got to do with the quantum level of things. Uh, you don't see a dinosaur – because a dinosaur, dinosaur is simply just too far off that quantum envelope to actually interact. If those waves connect for brief periods in time, then we can see, we can hear, we can witness, we can even interact with the past, the present, and, and the future, as crazy as that seems. But well, it's very I, I brief. Have a, I have another theory about – idea about residuals, which is residual hauntings, and I think Cheryl might have an insight on this, is that spirits – also like to give you impressions and they like to give you they can they can cause you to have certain images and uh you know see through the mind of other other you know people both living and non-living they can even give you the memories of somebody else and i had wondered if what we call residual hauntings is not simply a spirit or many spirits who had at one time been with people who had lived long ago had been with them their entire lives actually and when those people had gone they remain with the memories of those people past to impress them upon the generations to come and you know what yeah i'm sorry go ahead may i emphasize on that you are 100 percent right i just wanted to tell you that thank you well and and again that's one It does relate with quantum theory a little bit closer than most people think. All of it does. It's just people don't have the time to sit down and look at the math and all the 
think of it this way. You're right because everything does actually operate all at the same moment in time. Every individual, everything, everything operates outside of time as we see it. We define time because we have to, and it is relevant to a certain point, but on a quantum level, none of that is relevant. So you're right because all of that does technically exist all at the same moment in time. So it's easy enough for us to absorb that now and you take it what? with us when we're gone. On that, we got to be gone. We're at our, we've passed our, our break. So if you're listening to WBHM-DB.com, we'll be back in a couple minutes. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. I'm your host, Denise Pridemore, and I wanted to say my guests tonight are we're having a great discussion and too bad uh, you guys can't hear it all um, because during the break it just keeps on going. We can't stop, get them off break to come back, and we can't get them off the show to go on break. So, so it's kind of going both ways. And uh, I want to say thank you to Emily Menhouse. She says I can officially say that she says she can officially say she's become a Chris Houston fan tonight, and she well, sent you a message. And second of all, she also said this is a great show, one of my favorites I have listened to. So thank you so much for those compliments. I I was really needing a compliment. For a change. And the bad part is, is I didn't get the compliment. They did. So, so there you go. You guys got compliments. So back to some of the things we were talking about on break. Normally talk about cryptids, but we, you guys were saying that there's been an uptick 
in canine sightings? And does that mean like dogmen? You want or, to hear something yeah. crazy about your claim there, Frank? Um, and that cat was backing, I think, a little bit in the background there about people being uh, highly aggressive on the uh, canine human version. It doesn't surprise me. When I did my show um, on FMAM, guys, I did a whole piece on uh, werewolves and skinwalkers. Um, and I was going to write a book about it. So I had an author on that wrote a book. I can't even remember the name of the book now, and he warded me off of it right off the bat about, you know, be careful on this because there are people out there that'll that'll get very aggressive quick. I actually had to stop talking about skinwalkers and werewolves because I got personal threats, including somebody throwing a, a rock through my window telling me it was time to stop. Wow. <laughs> why, why that you had to stop, what, revealing their secrets or just talking about them in general? I have no idea. I had to have been on to something because it sure pissed somebody off. <laughs> well, you know, some people get a bee in their butt for nothing. Well, and the strange thing is, some t- I, I think it had to do more with cults in that situation. Uh, just like the vampire cult used to be very um, under the ground, believe it or not, there is a lycanthropy and skinwalker cult that if uh, you reveal that they exist, they will come after you. That's just exactly so what I was getting ready to say. So, so when they talk about the, okay, here my my only experience has been with supernatural. Okay. So there are there is lycanthropy out there. There's there are cults that believe in lycanthropy. Um, I firmly actually will tell you I believe in skinwalkers uh, because I spent time on a Native American ranch and what I saw I cannot explain. In fact, I sold the story so that they could put it into a video game that nobody knows about anymore. But um, I I spent the night at a at a chief's ranch after. A long time of trying to get in because I wanted to learn the American Indian culture, and he told me that his ranch was right off the side of what they believed were skinwalkers and that they were tormented and they were angry, so they would show up in the middle of the night. And he boarded his windows up every every night um, with these little shafts and replaced the wood every morning. And I got to tell you, I got no sleep that night because there was something that sounded almost human but not quite human, growling and snarling, climbing on the roofs scratching at the doors and the windows and there were marks all over the place at the end and and his uh two sheep he left outside were slaughtered so Mm. after that it was like okay there's something to this i'm not gonna i'm not gonna poke at it any further i got my answer (laughs) okay well so so are there other uh things making themselves known here recently that you know bigfoot um emily says reptilians are there more aliens things like that are there more of those now showing up with i mean are they being cited more ironically you're going to see a little bit more here come out um i can't tell you anything more about that but you're going to see a little bit more here come out about that um in the next year not as much as people think but the answer is yes there's 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 more out there than any of us know about, including the government. Oh, I have a yeah, story. Now, oh, a little, oh, 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 yeah, let me let her get this in. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I lived out in Garland, Nebraska, on a farm. When I first moved in, I knew it was completely haunted. A lot of people have investigated there. Mm-hmm. I was only there three days, and I was bending over to plug in my phone. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, everything around me became very rippled, like water you know, dripping, and it rippled everywhere around me. And as I was sitting there, all of a sudden, I was totally disorientated, and I felt from my uh, wing blades in the back of my back, um, I felt what it felt like to me was probes going down my back, all the way down my area down below, all the way to my kneecaps and back up on my back. And after that happened, um, three nights later, I found myself in the middle of a cornfield at three in the morning in my pajamas, surrounded by cows. I had no inclination as to how I got there. I ran back to the house, which would have been a good stretch, got back in the house, shut the door, and I was totally freaked out. Now, the next 
following night, I was recording my sleep. I always do because there was so much activity. And I saw a lot of a lot of grays walking through the house. So I always woke up again at 3 o'clock in the morning. I took my camera. I have a picture that would blow your minds. I went outside on the patio, did a panoramic view of the back where all the cows were, all the way around to the side of the house. I took a picture that literally almost knocked me on my butt because when I did, what I saw through the camera freaked me out. I had an alien standing within three feet of me, and I have a picture of it. I went in the house, shut the door. I was so freaked out that I called <clears throat> several people to come and stay with me because I thought for sure I wasn't going to make it like another two or three days beyond the scope of what was going on at that time. So, yeah, I have a picture that I think you guys would be very interested in. And I have um, reduced it down in color. You know, that's the only manipulation I've done, and you can see it clearly. The strangest thing about this is, is the right eyeball on this thing is so bright, you have to wonder what's coming out of his eye. It is so bright. Well, I can so, I can honestly tell you, and you're going to see this more and more because uh, there's no reason to hide it. it it's right. been in the background. I can honestly tell you that from a government standpoint, you are going to see open admission that, yes – we are aware these things exist. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are aware these things are around. And no, we have no idea what they're doing. Now, right. in the past, that was a very dangerous road to go down. When you're when you're supposed to be in control of everything, you don't tell people you don't know anything. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but at this point, there's no way around it. There's absolutely no way around it. And during that process, you're going to see a few things released, even though most of it's blacked out. That will tell you why they're doing this and why they're also not giving you everything if you look close enough into the documentation. But um, but yes, there's there's more out there than we know about. And unfortunately, our government is about as blind as we are. Well, it's <laughs> I mean, one of the things they say is uh, that we can't handle the truth. I wonder if that's true. Well, well to me speaking, I couldn't a heartbeat. To a point, think about where they – think about from 1950 to 1970 where they stood. Um, and I, I perfectly – being a part of military background, I perfectly understand this. To stand in front of somebody and say, I have no idea what I'm dealing with. I cannot identify it, and I cannot stop it. I cannot control it um, is a very dangerous move because you have no idea what it is. And you're admitting weakness, and that means that the public's right. going to panic. Now, if you add that on top of religious belief and so forth today, you could also be tearing a whole new universe of danger. Um, so a lot of not telling you what was going on is simply not knowing how to tell you they don't know what's going on. <laughs> right. Exactly. So there, I mean, there's so many things. I mean, there's people out there that believe that Cheryl Ann had an experience, not with an alien, but with a spirit or a demon, um, depending upon their thought process. Um, a friend of mine who's no longer with us, he would have said that Cheryl Ann was dealing with a demon and that she needed to be exercised because right. of that. Um, From my but other people would say no. So I, I, right. I, I'll tell you, it wasn't it wasn't a demon because if a demon presented himself that clearly to you in his exact image, and I'd have to get into more detail with you on you describing that image to see if it even matches any of the books I could get a hold of. I'm a big theologist, by the great. way, guys. I would love that. Um, yeah, I, I've had access to images and books. In fact, I've got three or four still here, and I got a whole bunch of them in storage that uh, I've collected throughout the years that would fascinate the minds on on things that most people don't do don't know about and and i'll tell you if a demon wanted to show his physical appearance to you then uh you ain't coming back from it <laughs> well just a heads Believe up me, i yeah. had to go to church and get uh totally reanointed in christ after that and i also had to get cleansed the whole shebang 
Because when I left her house, I, I couldn't even hardly drive. Something was seriously wrong with me. I went straight to my church. It's it's a dangerous road. It it really is. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, the person that would have said that it was demonic was Ken Deal. That's mm-hmm. what he would have said. Okay. And I guarantee. Yeah. And uh, he went to. He grew up with my husband. So they were to, they were they knew each other as kids. And not well, only uh, would also, would also Ken good. say that, so would Kevin Malick. Mm-hmm. Based on my knowledge of. How those two would debate over that, that well, they would always agree. <laughs> some of your after effects would make sense if it was a demon. It's just very highly, highly rare for right. it to show its its physical and actual image. Um, right, and, and that's what Ken would say as well. If it does, it means it's it's one hundred percent not afraid of you. Right, um, and it and and at that point believes it has control. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a that is a very rare thing. And it also means that it it's a pretty high ranked little booger there. Cause, yeah, because <laughs> the rest of them yeah. won't do it. Right. So so Frank, what were you going to say? Uh, I plum forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. uh, I'm so but sorry. One thing, I sh- one, one thing that's in my mind though is that um, what what you all dance, what you all talking about really is the question when dealing with spirits or alien UFOs, whatever. This is one of the reasons why in the book, um, Encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man, when speaking about aliens and UFOs and all that, and examining the characteristics they appear to exhibit, I I match them up against what people report are the characteristics in um demanding hauntings or you know spirit apparitions things like that and i found them to be way too similar to be a coincidence so i likened them to be the same and the big question is which all of you started to really dance on really nicely is why won't these things just simply present themselves to us as they actually are why the smoke and mirrors again back to maybe we can't handle it well and part of it if you are truly religious also talks about that particular war and let's face it if i present myself in a different manner uh if i'm going to walk up to you and give you everything you want and i'm handsome you're probably going to like me if i'm not so pretty then you're probably not going to like me as an example so presentation a lot of times in good and evil it it, it all revolves around that an angel or or an ultimately good thing doesn't have to really present itself as good you either believe he's good or you don't but something evil and scary is probably not going to come to you looking revolting in its true image (laughs) <laughs> right. If they were to actually show themselves to you as they actually are, because each of us has a little – you see, we have what's called spirit DNA. It goes back to the book of Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 2 when the Lord created Adam. He formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, and to make him alive, he breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, and Scripture says that Adam became a living soul. Okay, that breath of life is passed down from person to person to person throughout all of our genealogies. Everybody has a little bit of it in it, and this is why everybody is compelled to seek their creator, to find their God. It's like the missing father or missing parent syndrome. You never know who who your parents were, but there's something inside you that needs to know. It's that. And this thing is also abrasive to the spirit world. This is why they're, another reason why they're kind of half-handsy with you, mm-hmm. and they don't come full bore at you. You're, you're kind of dangerous to them in a certain way, because that Holy Spirit in you could be used against them at any time, and they know it. It's dangerous for them. And uh, if they were to really come at you as they actually are, that little piece of spirit inside of you will recognize right then and there, oh my gosh, everything is right and they are really are evil there really is a god there really is a jesus christ and the thing that they don't want to do is give you reason to believe in the lord god most high coming at you as they actually are would do that it would be validation it would be proof and speaking for somebody who has had that happen it is proof yeah (laughs) i can agree 
So, um, oh, one one more thing before go. you know, while I'm on a, while I'm on a ramble, uh, we were talking about when she was meant, talking about the um, the alien on her porch in the picture, and Chris uh, began speaking about other kinds of demons and spirits. Um, I didn't remember it immediately. I had to go looking for it. But in the book of Matthew, chapter 17, Jesus sends out his disciples to go cast out demons and to heal the sick. A couple of them come back to him and say, Lord, there's one that we cannot cast out. We don't know why. And so Jesus has to go do it himself. And when he does, they ask, well, why, why could you do it and not us? He says, because this type, this kind, goeth out not by – but by prayer and fasting. So there are different kinds of spirits, not just the the garden variety that show up and, you know, wreck your house, you know, or scare the living bejesus out of you. There are different kinds of genuses of spirits in the spirit world we have to deal with. And you because you're dealing difference. because you're dealing with that battle of good and evil, they have different motives, different methods, different ideologies. Yeah. Um, they're holding all the cards. Please, please understand, we are flesh and blood. This is how we know we are. The cat knows how to be a cat. The dog knows how to be a dog. That's what they are. We are humans. We only know flesh and blood. They are spirit, and because we also have spirit in us, I mean it's second nature to them. They can read you like a book. If mm -hmm. you've got a button to push, they know how to push it. And exactly. speaking about pushing buttons… We are at our last break. You're listening to WBHM-DB.com, and we will be back with Frank, Chris, and Cheryl Ann in just a few minutes. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Come on, I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see if the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the Paranormal Pride. I hope you guys are having a great time. My guests tonight are Frank J. Bennett, Chris Houston, and Cheryl Ann Elliott Fletcher. And we have been having, well, I don't know about anybody else, but I've been having a good time. And so has Emily. So, Ed, so the listeners having a great time. I'm, I'm happy as pie. So um, we did get an interesting question from um, Emily. She says, um, you can see a spirit, but can you discern a spirit? Discern. Now, scripture scripture asks you, it asks you to be one who can who has the power of destination, and it, it's hard, it's easier for some than others. But scripture scripture actually thinks it's a good idea. You know how to do this. 
But then there's people out there that say if you speak to spirits that you're you're going against God. Well, no, yeah, but... it's, it's different from that. This, this, this nation is being able to tell the difference or being exactly. able to know what it is when you're looking at it. Now, communication is different. It's it's kind of like uh, you know, if if you if you walk, if you see somebody that's a known troublemaker, it's one thing to look at him go, okay, I don't really, I shouldn't mess with that, talk to that guy. He's he's just trouble. And but there's a there's a party that just wants to kind of mess with them, and you start with them, and you get trouble. Well, guess what? <laughs> you brought it on yourself. You right. had the destination, but you acted poorly anyways. Long story short, Emily. Um... Can you determine what's what? The answer is yes, but it's not as black and white as often as people think when you're standing in front of it at that moment. Sometimes you have to prod a little bit. Sometimes you have to observe. Um, a truly evil demonic situation has a particular signature of things to look for, though I can't go over a lot of that now because you learn a lot of that not – by asking, although asking helps, if you can get a hold of the right people and they actually give you the right Im- the right information, but also observation, um, because these things do have specific things when they're truly evil that they repetitively do, um, including attacking people, um, just not the way most people think. Like you mentioned earlier, you get really, really sick, right? You get really, mm-hmm. really sick. Um, these things will do that. Now, ghosts can do that too, but the, the, the demonic will take that to another level. I have witnessed them attacking specific situations people shouldn't know about. I have a, a friend of mine that uh, I've only had the privilege of working with two or three times, but I've known him for years that um, he doesn't talk about it. But a long time ago, he had a very bad drug habit that he doesn't share with anybody else. Now, I didn't even know this at the time. But um, when that demon was present, it physically attacked that situation and confronted him with it through not one device, not two devices, but four devices in a room, and then made him sick, and he had to leave and couldn't come back in. Now, it repetitively did that to multiple people just to prove its point. Hey, look, I'm bigger and badder than you. I may not be able to touch Chris, but I can touch you. Um, so these things can be identifiable, but it's not always black and white. It, it's not easy to do. Um, you just got to kind of hope for the best and observe and not poke and prod too much because if you do and you don't know what you're doing, you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. You never, you can never get those worms back in the can. Yeah. Ever. They don't, ever, they don't like going back in there once they're out. So, um, What do you guys think about um, children and spirits? You know, in my case, my children told us that our house was haunted. It wasn't a shock. I already knew, but they they never heard me say anything about it. But they came to me and said, Mom, there's a there's a boy in our house. I only had girls. So they said that and kind of freaked their dad out because and we didn't really know how to talk to them about it back in the eighties um, and early nineties. What do you guys think about kids growing up talking about spirits? Well, I think, I think they do see them. I mean, when I was a kid, I saw my first, whatever it was. And I witnessed many things after that. Um, I think they have a little bit more of an open mind. It's ironic because um my child didn't experience anything until quite recently. In fact, I keep her separated even though she knows her dad's in the paranormal. My office is my office, so I don't address anything with it. But uh, So she's never really experienced anything until recently. Now she's experiencing some unusual things because something wants to tell her, hey, look, I'm here, and communicate with her. But um, uh, I believe children, you know, that they're, they're more open-minded. They, they see, see these things because – They haven't been told not to. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And what I want to say to that is, is when people come to me and tell me that their children are seeing things, I say, whatever you do, don't do what society does and condition them to make them think that they are just seeing things or they're making it up or whatever. You need to let your children be able to speak and tell you what they're seeing because they're more innocent. 
and and you know they're wide open and and until you know people say differently you know don't let your children be discouraged on what they're what they're going through that's my take well my my family told me not to say anything for years yeah. Yeah. i never stopped seeing things because i knew what i saw mhm um and i'm a rebel that way i don't do what people say um right on. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's just the way that it's been but yet because of that i never told ron a lot of things that i saw until the late 90s so here he is he's been married to me 11 12 years and he had no clue at the time that i really could see spirits until somebody validated something that the the spirit boy we kept seeing in our home uh, me and the kids, somebody else outside the family without being asked about it was able to validate who he was and why he was there. So in my case, I never discouraged my kids, but I also didn't try to drag it out of them. Exactly. I let them talk about what they were going to talk about and go from there. And my my cousin's in the chat room and she has a young a lot of the stuff that's happening is family. We know it's a family trait to to hear spirits, to know they're there, to to see them or feel them, sense them. Regardless, we know that they're there. And it's on both sides of my family. But as I told her in the chat, Grandma Lula used to tell stories about um, spirits in the houses down there on in, in Baltimore, on Annapolis Road, um, in New Jersey. Um, when they lived there, you know, all these different places, she would tell me about spirits that she had seen there. But I was four when she died. So, you know, it's been a long time. Should April encourage her son to give her more detail about what's going on or just let him talk about it like it's matter of fact? I'd let him talk about let it. Let him talk. Um, yeah. yeah. Don't don't encourage it either either way. Let him express himself because that's the best way that any gift can develop. Um, that way you're not leading the child. The child is actually physically telling you and feeling better about himself in the process about what he's experiencing. So like if I said to my, my grandson keeps telling me he sees monsters. He's, I see a monster. I see a monster. But he watches a lot of YouTube videos where they the kids say, I see a monster. I see this or that. With him, I'm not, I'm just going to let him talk, and I'm just going to act like it's just a normal part of every day. I'm not going to sit there and try to drag out of him what the monster looks like, right? Right. And one thing too, you got to remember, children have great imaginations, uh -huh. and don't ever, you know, um, don't ever suppress that because, well, you know, our imaginations and children are everything. Because, well, you know, maybe later on in in life, he could be you know, in film, you know, creating monsters. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you never want to just discourage that. I mean, you want to let him be, you know, creative and, and tell his stories because, wow, those are really important to him. Do you think that maybe his mother should encourage him to write it down in a notebook or maybe that she should, should tape him talking about it I so that she can it. write it down in a notebook? No, I would not tape that. I would, yeah, I would just let yeah. him let him be creative him about it and let him discuss yeah. about it. If he yeah. wants to write it down, let him write. He, he'll get led in the position that, as long as it's not a bother. I'm going to backtrack a little bit because um, somebody out there, I firmly believe, needs to hear this tonight because of something that you said. And I don't know why. I'm just going to say it. Sometimes this happens. Um, but you said, you know, a lot of people believe that when you're talking to ghosts or you're experiencing this or you're running into this, that, that, that it's the devil's work and so forth. I want people to understand that God works a little bit differently than what a lot of people think. Sometimes you are granted gifts for specific reasons. And though church or somebody else, and, and I'm not downing anybody's religious belief, though church or somebody else might tell you you're communing with the devil, you don't know that. It, unless you're doing something that does commune with the devil, and you'll know if you're doing that. I'm not even going to get into that. Right. Um, seeing a ghost or having an ability is a gift from God. Amen. Thank you. 
Um, uh, and don't mistake it otherwise, because somewhere along the line, you may have to use that gift. Exactly. That's <laughs> well, what I do. What I did is I told, I just told April in the chat room, I feel like her son needs to keep a journal, whether it's written or drawings, some way for him to express the, this kind of stuff so he can feel like he's getting it all out. And, yes. uh, and like I said, I think that it's just something he's inherited from our family genes. So, you know, at this point, we're going to stop that part of the show. How can people find you, Cheryl Ann? Oh, the best way they can find me is, is on Facebook on Cheryl Ann Elliot Fletcher, or they can find me um, on Instagram as well under Extraordinary Lyrics because I write lyrics. So they either one is fine. Okay. Uh, Chris, where can people find Chris Houston? Well, Facebook right now, but just so that everybody knows, I am starting here in the next, uh, hopefully in the next two or three months, I'm starting some educational seminars. Some of them will be online, um, some training courses on the reality of the paranormal. We're actually going to be inviting some fairly well-known people in the process, hopefully to do that so that they can do their own little classes and so forth. Most of that is 100% free unless you want to buy into the textbooks and so forth. Um, so we're not making any money off of that. It's just an educational piece. Uh, otherwise, I will be doing seminars for Michigan State University, Ohio State University, and hopefully if COVID clears up a little bit, you'll start seeing me speaking at a lot of the conventions this year on the realities of the paranormal. As you noticed, I know a lot of different things, and I've educated a lot of people throughout the years, so um, by all means, look for me. Well, then I will give your name to the people who ask me for names of people that I felt were reputable that would be good to have at a paranormal conference. Awesome. Apparently, my opinion goes a long way. I, I don't oh. know why. I think it's because I I think it's because I tell the truth all the exactly. time. Exactly. So, Frank, where can everybody find Frank when he's not out shoveling we, snow? When he's out with his shirt off, yeah. Thank you, Carrie Lynn. I appreciate the comments. For assuming it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you can find me at www.biblebybenna.com. You can find me on my Amazon web page as an author. Of course, I do have three Facebook pages. One of them is a tribute to the late, great Don Wells. You can find that. My next public appearance is slated for April 16th through the 18th in Roanoke, Virginia. Happy Trails returns to Roanoke, Virginia. You can see me and meet a lot of your favorite stars from Western film and TV. If anything pops up in the meantime, I'll let you know. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening tonight and being part of this great show. I may do this again sometime. I think that this was a fun way to have a show, and I didn't have to do a lot of homework, Aww. which is perfect. So um, it helps that I – Chris, I didn't – like I said, Chris, I didn't know very well, but I think I know him pretty well now. And I know enough I know enough about Cheryl and Frank to be completely and utterly dangerous, but I keep all that stuff to myself and go with the stuff I don't know. <laughs> so next, next week my guest is uh Jay Bakachin. I think that's how you say it, from Finding Jay. So I'm gonna have a Bigfoot guy on and uh I met him personally. That's the only reason I asked him and uh I Jay's a nice know, guy. It'll be a fun show. Hey, I want to know why I should believe in Bigfoot. That's why, why I'm having him on to to explain to me why I should. I know I've read your book, Frank. I know I should, but we don't know that. <laughs> so it's I want. Isn't it amazing? This. Sasquatch did not come up once in this whole discussion. I know. That's why we have to have more roundtables. Isn't so, that funky yeah. wackadoodle? Yep. <laughs> So everybody have a great night. Keep me in your prayers and hopefully next Monday at 7 p.m. Central we'll have a have another Paranormal Pride with a brand new guest and we will have a great time with that too. We love you Denise. Is, we love you Denise. Thank you. <laughs> and we Thank love you. you guys too. So you're listening to WBHM-DB.com out of Birmingham, Alabama. We'll talk to you all next Monday.